Good morning, Pastor Ed from Hope Lutheran Church in Freehold, New Jersey, with the last of our Lenten daily devotions for Saturday, April the 3rd, 2021. Uh, again, we'll have one last chance to listen to Pastor Eric Burtness uh, look at a question that uh, uh, Jesus asked um, after his resurrection uh, on, on Easter morning and uh, how that applies to our own lives. The reading is from the 20th chapter of John, uh, verses 19 to 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Again, this is the final question that we have in our look at Beyond Question, the, all the questions Jesus asked during his ministry. It's the story of Thomas, the well-known one. Thomas, uh, uh, the, the doubter, probably gets a little bit of an unfair reputation, as some people have noted and that I'd like to share before we get to what Pastor Burtness wrote. Uh, of course, this year, um, Monday, Thursday fell on April 1st, which is April Fool's Day, um, and, of course, we've probably all heard about April Fool's jokes or pranks. Um, as kids, we did them. I, my family used to do them to me terribly. Um, and we kind of get sucked into them, even, even though, and I used to do this. I used to prepare myself as much as possible to be on my guard, and, and I would still get uh, tripped up. But sometimes these April Fool's pranks or jokes were done on a national scale. Uh, for instance, on April 1st, 1996, the Taco Bell Corporation took out a full-page ad that appeared in six major newspapers announcing that it had bought the Liberty Bell and was renaming it the Taco Liberty Bell. Hundreds of outraged citizens called the National Historic Park in Philadelphia where the bell was housed to express their anger. Their nerves were only calmed when Taco Bell revealed a few hours later that it was all a practical joke. The best line of the day, however, came from came when White House Press Secretary Mike McCurry was asked about the sale. And thinking on his feet, he responded that the Lincoln Memorial had also been sold. It would now be known as the, the Ford Lincoln Mercury Memorial. And then a couple of years later, on April 1st, 1998, Burger King published a full-page advertisement in USA Today announcing the introduction of a new item to their menu, a left-handed Whopper, specifically designed for the 32 million left-handed Americans. According to the advertisement, the new Whopper included the same ingredients as the original Whopper, lettuce, tomato, hamburger, patty, etc., uh, but all the condiments were rotated 180 degrees for the benefit of their left-handed customers. The following day, Burger King issued a follow-up release revealing that although the left-handed Whopper was, in fact, a hoax, thousands of customers had gone into restaurants to request the new sandwich. Simultaneously, according to the press release, many others requested their own right-handed version. You know, people are still falling for hoaxes uh, every day, uh, especially due to the power of the, the Internet and social media like Facebook. Fake stories appear quite often, often mislead a lot of people. It causes many people to say 
Of course, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, according to David Simpson, such skepticism is not new. In fact, there's, he says, a well-known disciple of Jesus who was quite skeptical about the news that Jesus had conquered death and come back to life. Because of his skepticism, we call him, of course, Doubting Thomas. Thomas did not want to be called a fool. He did not want to be pranked. When told about the resurrection of Jesus, he said these famous words as recorded uh, in John 25 about, unless I put, unless I see his hands, unless I put my uh, finger in his side, I will not believe. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, but he said, unless I see the nail marks in my hands, put my finger where the nails were, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. I will not believe, said Thomas. He didn't want to be fooled. Um, we could probably relate to Thomas. Um, we don't like to be fooled either. Most of us are also very skeptical, skeptical rather, about things that anything that sounds too good to be true. A fellow by the name of Sam McCormick writes, Doubting Thomas was a more unfair moniker ever pinned on a person. For by taking into account the full account uh, of his first encounter with the risen Jesus, Thomas may be just as rightly styled as believing Thomas. For reasons we cannot presume to know, the resurrected Jesus first appeared to his disciples at a time when Thomas was absent. Hearing their claim to have seen Jesus alive, Thomas did not believe it, of course. Well, Thomas is labeled as the doubter because evidence was necessary to enable and energize his belief that Jesus had indeed conquered death and vacated the tomb. Evidence that the other disciples, keep this in mind, evidence the other disciples already had. If a need for evidence is an unnecessary and improper criterion for belief in the resurrection, we might similarly label all apostles, says McCormick, as doubters. For Mark reports that when Mary Magdalene reported to them that she had, Jesus, that she had seen Jesus alive, they too refused to believe it. And then a fellow by the name of uh, Mark Stevenson um, writes, The most famous doubter of all time is Thomas. Uh, through history, Judas has been the only disciple criticized more than Thomas. Tradition has given him a new name, Doubting Thomas. He wanted proof that Jesus was indeed resurrected from the dead. But can you blame him? When the resurrected Christ appeared to some of his disciples, Thomas was not there. Can you imagine seeing someone die? knowing he was buried, and then hearing from friends that they'd seen him alive. You might feel sympathetic toward them, expecting them to get over it in time if they keep telling you on and on and on. You might feel the need to confront them. That was the situation faced by Thomas. In recent years, many Christians have been more sympathetic to Thomas, however. They've recognized that if they had been in the same position as he was, they may have had the very same doubts. In his position, um, I have no doubt, Mark Steverson is writing here, uh, that I would have been a doubter. My nickname might have become Doubting Mark. And then he quotes devotional writer Selwyn Hughes, who writes, Those who doubt most and yet strive to overcome their doubts turn out to be some of Christ's strongest disciples. Thomas was transformed, saying, My Lord and my God. And that does not hit us as powerfully as it would have hit the original disciples, because you see, before that day, they called Jesus rabbi, meaning teacher, of course. They called him Christ, meaning the anointed one. They called him the son of the living God. But no one, no one before Thomas had ever called Jesus God. Jewish leaders would have not hesitated to pass the death sentence on Thomas for blasphemy. It was an incredible and dangerous thing to say. The Bible says that the one who had been most honest about his doubts, was the first to call Jesus God. Isn't that interesting? There are traditions that say he was also the disciple who traveled the furthest to tell others about Christ. Tradition teaches that he proclaimed the gospel in Babylon, Persia, and all the way to India. There are Christian churches in southern India claiming to trace their heritage directly back to Thomas. Well, this Mark Steverson writes three Weeks ago, when he's writing this, a Christian from India shared a testimony uh, with his church. And this young man was introduced as Andrew, um, and he was then asked his last name, and he responded, Thomas. 
Well, people were not expecting that. His family name could probably be traced back to the British colonial period. But maybe, just maybe, says Steverson, his name predates the British presence by more than a dozen centuries. Maybe one of his ancestors with a Hindu name became a Christian under the ministry of Thomas and changed his Hindu name in honor of the first Christian he had ever met. Maybe. Well, let's listen uh, for the last time to Pastor Burtness and what he says uh, about this whole question of doubting Thomas and um, have you believed because you've seen me? He writes, the disciples were hiding behind locked doors when Jesus appeared, risen from the dead. He greeted them with peace and showed them the scars in his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed. But Thomas wasn't there when this happened. When the other disciples told him that they'd seen the risen Lord, he said, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. In other words, seeing is believing. Many of us, like Thomas, want to believe, but first we want to see for ourselves. Just, just give us some proof, we say. Jesus came to the disciples again. This time Thomas was there, and Jesus spoke directly to him. Go ahead, look at my hands. Reach out and touch my side. Then Thomas said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus asked, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This blessing from Jesus is for all of us who have not physically seen him, but nevertheless believe. Seeing is believing is true in many cases, but when it comes to faith, believing is seeing. Believing is seeing the presence of Jesus with us on the road through life, on all the detours, in the midst of the mess, and everywhere we go. Jesus is there. Believing is seeing and experiencing him as he heals, strengthens, and guides us. Believing is beginning to see things differently, beginning to, to see how God is active in our lives and in the world. Jesus is with us every step along the way, leading, guiding, encouraging, and strengthening us for life's journey beyond question. And so, uh, final questions to ponder on this last day of this week and the last day of our um, uh, Lenten devotional series. He writes, list thing, three things that you've learned as you've worked through Jesus' questions. What are three things that you've learned? And then, what have you come to believe during this Lenten journey? And perhaps more importantly, how might you share this with someone else? Because again, the point of, of faith is not merely to, to change our lives, but, but faith also compels us, propels us, if you will, uh, to go out into the world and share it with others. Now, not everybody is going to become an evangelist. Not everybody is going to become a, a missionary. Uh, but there are small ways, little ways, humble ways that we can bear witness to Jesus in our lives. And not just how we live our lives, but also the things that, that we say and the example that we set. Well, let's close out this week and uh, the end of our Lenten devotions with prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all you have done. Thank you for leading me into deeper discipleship through your questions. Help me believe. Help me see. And always draw me close to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything. Amen. Well, tomorrow's Easter. And so we have at 9 o'clock, as I've been saying uh, all week long, at 9 o'clock we have our usual live streaming service and then weather permitting it it's still looking pretty good um, we're going to be outdoors uh, for our uh, at 11 o'clock um, for a uh, uh, an outdoor service a traditional elw uh, worship service and um, if in the slight chance that there would be uh, inclement weather where we couldn't be outdoors at 11 o'clock what we'll do is uh, Josh and I and, uh, and Ashley and Michelle will, will 
stay indoors and will live stream that traditional service at 11 o'clock. So one way or the other, we're going to have services at 9 and 11. 9 only live streaming, 11 o'clock outdoors, but if we can't be outdoors, uh, we will we will we will come indoors. You'll be able to stay home and if that's the service you choose and we'll do a live streaming service uh, of that 11 o'clock uh, ELW traditional service. So those two opportunities. And then um, Monday, of course, we start all over again. Uh, I'll have Cheryl send out the Taking Faith Home inserts so that um, you can follow along with the daily Bible readings as we kind of resume um, the pattern that we had uh, prior to Lent. And so I'm looking forward to continuing our daily devotions with you uh, beginning on, on Monday, uh, April the 5th. Until then, take care. Be well. Bye.